Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Nico Luchsinger, and on behalf of Asia Society Switzerland, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this Oxford-style debate today on the record of the first year of the second term of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his government. This is the very first Oxford-style debate that we are hosting here, so I'm equal parts excited and a little bit terrified that something may go wrong, and if it does, um, I'm asking you to bear with us as we as we try to fix it. So since this is the first time we're, we're doing such a format, um, I thought it might be helpful uh, to quickly explain how this is going to work. So first, uh, in just a little bit, you will all get to vote on whether you agree or disagree on today's motion. Uh, we will then have two teams arguing in favor or against the motion and trying to convince you to come to their side. We'll first hear opening statements and then rebuttals from each side. After that, we'll move into a discussion where we also welcome your questions. Um, if you do have questions for um, any of our panelists today, please submit them using the Q&A function, which you find at the bottom um, of your screen. You can there not just submit questions, you can also like um, and upvote other people's questions, and that will tell us that that's a question you, you particularly want to hear the answer to, so we'll try to get those uh, first. And finally, each team will have five minutes uh, for closing arguments. And after that, it's time for you to vote for a second time. And again, we will ask you whether you agree uh, with the motion being set out. And then we will compare the results from the first and the second vote. And the team that has, in terms of percentage, gained more votes, uh, pulled more people over to their side, uh, will be the winner of this debate. Of course, as you're probably all aware, today's motion is one year after being reelected. The Modi government is delivering on its promises. Um, and we will start the initial vote now. Um, uh, the question should appear on your screen and would ask you all to let us know what you think. So while you do that, um, by way of introduction, almost exactly one year ago, um, a little more, a few days more, the results of India's general election were published. And they delivered a sweeping win for the ruling coalition led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP. For Indian politics um, of the last decades, which had often exhibited a strong anti-incumbency bias, this was an anomaly. Um, the expectations for Modi's second term were accordingly high. Um, so I'm, I'm going to now close the poll, hoping that you have all uh, had a chance to submit your votes. We're not going to share the results of this poll now. We'll wait with this until uh, the very end. Thank you very much uh, for your. Um, uh, thank you very much for your uh, vote. Good. Um, a lot has happened in this one year since the elections, not just in India but around the world. Um, and exactly one year ago today, actually, we here at Asia Society Switzerland hosted a live event in Zurich. Um, I'm not sure if you remember live events. It was a thing we were able to do before coronavirus. Um, and we discussed the election results uh, with two experts, Shane Crabtree and Ruth Katamori. And we're very thrilled that both of them have agreed to return today um, on opposite sides of the debate uh, for this argument. So let me, with this, introduce now um, our teams. Um, we have arguing for the motion. Um, and uh, if the speakers could now turn, on, turn back on their cameras, please. Arguing for the motion, um, but not yet on screen, but she's definitely here, Ruth Katamuri, who is the founder and co-director of the India Observatory at the London School of Economics. Um, and as of June 15, just in a little while, will serve as the new senior director for economic, youth, and sustainable development at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And joining her um, on the side, arguing in favor of the motion, is uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, the government of India's own think tank, which is chaired uh, by Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself. Um, Dr. Rajiv Kumar is also the Chancellor of the Gokhal Institute of Economics and Politics in Pune. On the other side, and arguing against the motion, uh, we have the aforementioned James Crabtree, author and journalist based in Singapore. Um, James was the Mumbai Bureau Chief for the Financial Times until 2016, and he's the author of the best-selling book, The Billionaire Raj. And finally, joining James on the side of uh, arguing against the motion, we have Rupa Subramanya, economist, independent scholar, and commentator focusing on the Indian economy, joining us today from Ottawa in Canada. Um, thank you all for being with us, for joining us from four different time zones. 
Uh, we're glad that you've all made time for this important debate. Um, and as mentioned before, we now without further ado, jump right into um, opening remarks uh, for which speakers have exactly five minutes. Um, and as is customary here uh, with Oxford style debates, um, the first opening remarks will be delivered by the team arguing for the motion um, and Ruth Katamuri will do that. So uh, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to come back to this one year on. Um, just to start with, what I would like to say is India in context, it is the largest democracy in the world with 1.3 billion people, which is approximately three, three times the size of the European Union. 45% of um, Indians are below the age of 20 years, which is about the size of the European Union population. 34% of global youth and those in the age of, I mean, those in the age of 15 to 24, as of 2020, are in, uh, is an Indian uh, person. And this democracy has expressed a strong confidence with giving uh, a very clear mandate for Modi 2.0. The second thing I want to mention is Modi's leadership. In my view, Modi's leadership is very proactive. It is very decisive with the courage to implement disruptive programs to enable growth and development for India. He's extremely hardworking and he wants to make development happen. I'll just give an example, which is very often quoted example. Um, the, the GST reforms evidence shows that in 2019, the tax compliance went up to 75%. It was way below 50% before that. So it's gone up by 75%. This is the uh, impact of uh, some of these reforms which appeared disruptive and were, and were difficult. I, and then I want to talk about the interim budget 2019 and the budget 2020. As I see it, there, these budgets have been focused on growth, enabling growth and inclusion. So some of the things I just referred to are um, decrease in corporate tax to align with other countries globally, increase in foreign direct investment limits, increase in income tax for high earners, expansion of credit guarantees, and then merger of 10 public sector banks to become four big banks to improve the efficiency and competence. So in the budget 2020, the highlights were on decreasing tax for lower income groups, and more infrastructure, more public infrastructure, airports, railways, and other public services. Ayushman Bharat, which is a health insurance policy for, uh, to enable health insurance for uh, poor people. Atal Pension Yojana, again, another welfare scheme. Um, then I want to also mention how this government uses technology very effic efficiently for effective implementation and good governance. I also briefly want to focus on um, what the leadership during the COVID that all of us now, the whole world, the, glo the global pandemic, which everybody is familiar with, uh, is in, in coming, to, coming together in this. So the leadership shown in terms of COVID implementation was praised by WHO as tough, but timely because to enable efforts by India, the efforts of India to close its international borders and enforce an immediate lockdown. So the numbers, just to give a context of the numbers, the number of cases in India are about 153,000. That's about 110 cases per million population. Um, um, in terms of deaths, uh, 4,348 deaths so far and about 64,500 people have rec recovered. So in terms of deaths, the, I mean, deaths are bad in any case, but um, in this case, uh, in terms of context, it's about three deaths per million is the current record. So what did the government do across the country? Technology was used very efficiently for tracking and tracing and isolation. And some of the good examples, which are now become uh, global case studies, is one of one example is that of Kerala. Thousands of hostels, hotels, and other institutions were set up for quarantine of Indians returning from overseas. 
hospitals, including mobile hospitals, were provided to help with care and treatment of people. So I'll stop here because I'm sure there'll be other things we can come back to during the discussion. All right, thank you very much, Ruth, uh, for those opening statements. Um, you can probably all hear me, you can't see me um, because it turns out I can't turn on my video myself. My colleague, Rebecca, has to do it. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you very much, Ruth, um, and thank you for sticking to the time limit. Um, that's great uh, if we do an Oxford debate. So let's just hand it right over to the team arguing against the motion for James Crabtree and his opening remarks. Please, um, the floor is yours, James. Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back here with the Asia Society, virtually, if not in person, um, as we were last year. And thank you both to Rupa, my partner, and to Dr. Rajiv Kumar and to Ruth, who gave a, a very eloquent um, introduction on the other side of this debate. I suppose I, the motion that we have here today is to look at Modi's second term, but I want to go back to 2014 when Modi was first elected. Uh, I was in Gujarat as a foreign correspondent. I saw Narendra Modi on the day that he was elected coming into a BJP headquarters thronged um, by, uh, by thousands of people who were hopeful of what his era of government would bring. Um, and there was huge optimism about what Modi could achieve, not even in, in small terms. People looked at what had happened in China and thought maybe India could not only potentially introduce reforms that would match China's economic performance, but perhaps boosted by its record as a technological innovator, a democracy, um, that it might actually be able to do even better than China. So that was the expectation that we had of Modi, the, the hope of what might come uh, from his, his policies. And it might surprise some of the Indians in the audience that actually as a foreign correspondent, I no more, more often found myself arguing in favor of Modi. So my, all my friends, Indian friends in South Mumbai and Central Delhi were great Modi skeptics. They said he was a, an extremist, um, that he wouldn't really deliver on economic reforms. And I tended to argue the toss and say, well, you know, he has this record as a chief minister. Maybe he won't turn out to be that bad. Maybe he'll actually do many of the things that he would promise. And I have to say that, that in arguing this side of the debate, I've been on my own personal journey about judging Modi. And the longer that Modi's record has gone on, the less impressive that I have found it, particularly as it's come into its second term. And so I suppose for my introduction, I just want to explain why and how our side of this debate will argue this. By the time we got to 2019, I think very few people had these same hopes for Modi's government. The idea that he would be a radical economic reformer, uh, had fallen by the wayside, particularly damaged by incidents like demonetization, the badly thought through experiment in taking away all of India's money. But time after time, when there were opportunities to introduce radical economic reforms, they, they weren't taken. Ruth talked about Narendra Modi's bravery. And actually, it was notable in his first term and also in his second that on economic reforms, most of the time, he's been a reasonably cautious politician. Um, on the same time uh, as his first term wore on, uh, you saw other indications of the character of the government that he was introducing, both uh, uh, an unwillingness to stare down the uh, cultural extremism of some of his most uh, ardent supporters, and also other incidents like his losing talented administrators and technocrats like Raghuram Raja and the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Fast forward to the 2019 election, and as I say, when he won a similarly impressive election victory, I don't think that many people really anymore held out hopes that suddenly a government that wasn't going to be radical and reforming in its first term was going to turn over a new leaf in its second. But still, that second term, I think, even before we get on to the, the moment of the COVID crisis, was surprising uh, for, in a sense, the fact that Modi was brave on his cultural a religious nationalist agenda in introducing very far-reaching reforms to the constitutional settlement for the region of Kashmir. Um, in, in other areas as well, uh, there was a court ruling um, about a, a famous temple rebuilding, which although this wasn't the government's um, decision, certainly emboldened his supporters. Um, there was the citizenship law that many of you will be aware of uh, that appeared to be for the first time a change to India's constitutional order, removing its secular underpinnings. These were all very bold moves, 
But again, on economic reforms, um, there really wasn't that much in the early stages of Modi's administration. Uh, my partner, Rupa, will, will talk a little bit more about this in her rebuttal. I would point only to one issue that I talked about in my own book, which was about the banking sector. Um, so banking has been one of the great, great um, problems that India has not yet been able to grapple with, the, the hangover of debt from the boom years in the middle of the 2000s. Ruth was correct to say that there were some modest reforms introduced, introduced, taking some of the very worst banks and folding them into public sector banks. But really, this wasn't grasping the nettle. And unfortunately, now with the COVID crisis, I think the lack of reforms in that area and many others are going to come home to roost. To conclude, this then brings us forward to how to judge what's happening right now in the COVID moment. And I think it is fair to say, to give credit to the government and actually probably credit to Rajiv Kumar, they have introduced a series of quite bold measures in response to COVID in agriculture and labor laws. But in a sense, I think our side of the argument is that, that India is in a worse position to deal with this crisis because of Modi's relatively weak record. And I think in a sense, we may look back on the last 10 years and think that India 10 years ago had a fantastic opportunity to leapfrog towards middle income status. And that what you've seen instead is a lost decade of a sort, um, which now the COVID crisis is going to worsen. So that I think is why Rupa and I think that you should support our side of the motion and we'll explain more as we go on. Over to you, Nico. Thank you very much, James. Um, and I think you've already, we're, we're, we're deep in the discussion, you've raised a lot of the very important points. Um, you have addressed uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, um, so let's turn it over straight to him for his three-minute rebuttal um, on, on anything he wants to point out um, from what you've said um, in your opening statement. Please, Rajiv. Good to be here on the Asia Society of the debate, uh, and I must uh, start off straight away by um, rebutting my friend James for saying that this government has not taken radical reforms. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask him whether he thought introducing the GST, which had been hanging for three decades, was not radical enough. Introducing, introducing the infrastructure, in, the, the, the insolvency and bankruptcy code wasn't radical, or the removal of the Essential Commodities Act, which is now going to be passed, or the bringing in of a central uh, trade law uh, to remove the pernicious APMC Act uh, was not radical. Uh, uh, hiking the uh, FDI um, limit to 76% in the defense production uh, and private and running uh, private trains in the railways, uh, which we you know which we uh, never had never thought of, and uh, handing over about 400 stations railway stations for private development and for commercial exploitation by the private sector or privatizing six new airports, uh, plus putting BPCL, uh, 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 a petroleum major, profit-making petroleum major on the block to be privatized and putting out this expression of interest was not radical enough. And then I myself chaired the committee on uh, liberalizing the investment uh, for um, uh, oil and pet uh, petroleum and gas. We now have a seamless license for uh, reconnaissance, prospecting and mineral and mining in the, in the mining sector. We have opened up the coal sector, which has been a monopoly since 1973 uh, to commercial mining. I can, I can go on, but I, I, mean, I, I just think that the definition of radical has somehow changed. I was in the government from 91 to 95 when we took the first set of reforms. And I can assure you from my experience that these are far more radical and difficult reforms to have undertaken during these, uh, this, this one year. And this is by the, or the last four years and then this one year than any other government had taken ever in India's history. Now the question is, the, the, the question to ask is that why, did, why was Modi re-elected with such a thumping majority in 1919? And which is because the first five years he spent and had pronounced uh, to build a base for equitable growth so that the, those at the bottom of the pyramid uh, could actually get the benefit of the growth and inequities will not rise. And that was the focus of the first five years. And I tell you that the best delivery of public services, you know, the direct benefits transfer, the use of uh, Jam Trinity, uh, you know, the transfer of about 460 odd schemes uh, directly cash back to the beneficiaries, all was that done in that regard. Now in this five years, the, ex the, the idea was to accelerate growth, and, and, and to build upon the foundation. Unfortunately, COVID has intervened. 
Otherwise, we would have seen uh, this going forward. And I, and I assure everybody that this government meant business, means business, and will promote private business as we go forward uh, in, in the, in, in the few remaining term of this government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Um, and, and I do see already um, a conversation to be had at a later point about sort of how radical is radical enough, perhaps. But before we do that, um, uh, I want to recognize Rupa Subramanya um, for her rebuttal arguing against the motion. Uh, Rupa, the floor is yours. Okay. So I was just saying, uh, thank you, Asia Society, and, uh, and I'm delighted to be part of this panel. I'll just jump into the rebuttal. Um, as James, my fellow panelist, has argued, we do not believe that the Modi government is delivering on its promises. Uh, for this, we must go back to 2014. Uh, uh, Modi's slogan was minimum government, maximum governance. Uh, and by that lofty standard, his government has failed in some very important respects, not just in its first term, uh, and but also continues to fail in its second term, having won an even bigger majority. Um, so let's get to Make in India. This was Modi uh, launching Make in India in 2014. He campaigned to make India a global manufacturing hub. That has not happened despite several opportunities in the form of global supply chain disruptions caused by the US-China trade war. And it doesn't seem like it's going to happen given the recent concerns about China coming out of the current COVID-19 crisis. Uh, in fact, recent surveys show firms exiting China or wanting to exit China are not necessarily looking to come to India primarily or in the first place with their focus uh, um, um, instead on Vietnam and other emerging markets in East Asia. And we have to ask why this is happening. Well, it's happening because India, despite uh, moving up in the rankings in the world businesses ease of doing uh, world banks ease of doing business rankings. India continues to remain an unfavorable place to do business. It has poor infrastructure, a largely unskilled workforce, and an uncertain tax and regulatory environment. This is the opposite of what uh, businesses want and the opposite of what Mr. Modi promised, not just in 2014, but also in 2019 when he was reelected. What has happened instead is India's make in India has, uh, Modi's make in India has degenerated into uh, classic old fashioned import substitution and protectionism, which has ended up reversing a quarter century of trade liberalization, which goes back to the 1991 economic reforms that opened up the Indian economy for the first time. Uh, so we've seen uh, higher tariffs, uh, which have ended up harming consumers uh, because they end up paying higher prices for these goods. They also disadvantage Indian producers uh, who have to pay more for their inputs. Uh, perversely, this actually ends up affecting, it, it's, it makes it harder to jumpstart manufacturing in India. Um, and it uh, also keeps India out of global supply chains and contributes to further uh, deglobalization of the Indian economy. What is unfortunate is that these lessons were learned in 1991, but, uh, but the Indian government uh, seems to be hell-bent on re repeating these mistakes. Um, and, um, and, and so the only, uh, and also the other thing that I want to address is structural reforms. Uh, Modi has not pursued the uh, st structural reforms that need to be undertaken in the Indian economy. So we have something called the unfinished reform agenda. So the 1991 economic reforms uh, dealt with the liberalization of trade of good and, goods and services and a, um, a, pr a privatization uh, effort and in removing industrial licensing, reducing tariffs and removing price controls. Unfortunately, um, the Modi government has not reformed the factors of production, uh, in, including land, labor and capital. Uh, there's been zero privatization of state-owned enterprises. They keep saying they, they're going to do it, but nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. They tried to privatize Air India, but um, th that hasn't happened so far. Um, I, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but your time is your time is up. Sure. <laughs> um, and I, I apologize uh, if I, if I, if I must interrupt, but uh, we're trying to we're trying to um, stick to the timeline here and give everybody the, the same space. But I think you've made some excellent points and, and set us up well for uh, for the coming debate. So um, let's jump right into that. Um, and before I do so, I want to remind everybody listening in. Um, that they can, you can submit your questions during um, on the Q and A panel. It appears that you can actually see other people's questions. You can't upvote them. I apologize. I thought that was possible. It's not. So um, let me assure you that there are a lot of questions already coming in. Um, if you do post one, you're not the first one, um, but you can still uh, submit submit a relevant question. Now, 
I do want to start asking James and Rupa, who are arguing against the motion. Uh, you've laid out all these points um, about why, in your view, the Modi government is, 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 is failing and not delivering on its promises. Um, but we do have to recognize that public opinion is not of the same view. Uh, the Modi government has been reelected quite sweepingly, as I mentioned at the beginning. That's unusual for Indian uh, standards. And I think, um, uh, I'm not sure if Ruth has mentioned this before, but uh, we've discussed this in preparation right now. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's approval rating is at a staggering 80 to 90 percent, which is quite remarkable. So let me ask you, uh, maybe Rupa right now, since I had to cut you off. Um, apparently, the Indian public disagrees with you. Why is that? Well, uh, they disagree with me because I think they're um, um, uh, primarily uh, they, they, they like Modi's cultural agenda, which is uh, not something that we've really gone into much so far in, in this discussion. Uh, the cultural agenda resonates um, more, more than the economic, uh, e economic agenda. Um, and uh, also bear in mind in the 2019 election, there wasn't really much in the way of an opposition. Modi was the only game in town. Uh, and even if people were uh, unhappy with uh, Modi's delivery uh, on the economy, uh, uh, the, his, the promises uh, that he failed to keep, including uh, creating millions of jobs and uh, making India a manufacturing hub, um, they were willing to give him another chance because you, you know, uh, India for most of its post-independent history was ruled by the Congress Party. So, what was the harm in giving Modi another chance? Uh, uh, you know, and just and and see what happens. But I think primarily uh, he he uh, people tend to identify with the cultural agenda, and uh, and also I think. Um, it's not clear how much of the economic agenda actually anim animates voters. It may sound good to them. Minimum government, maximum government sounded really good to the average voter, I guess, in 2014. But it's clear that that promise has really, uh, Modi has let, let, let down the Indian public on that promise. But yet, I think it's the cultural agenda that animates, animates people. All right, thank you very much. Um, Rajiv, if you want to respond to that, please. Um, I'm afraid uh, Rupa has uh, not uh, answered the question as to why Prime Minister Modi's current rating is between 81 to 90 percent. And if it was a cultural agenda, at least the minorities would have voted against him. And the minority percentage in the Indian population is above 15 percent in any case. So that is very clear that a share uh, that, that, that some people from within the minorities, you know, they they oversee the cultural agenda and see that the kind of governance that Mr. Modi is providing is suitable to their needs. I think the, the, what we're seeing, Nico, is a big divide between the Indian elite and the Indian people. And while, they, while the Indian people uh, would rather have a development state than not a minimum, minimal governance, and, uh, and, 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 and maximum governance is what Modi uh, promised, he had also to grapple with a number of legacy issues and inherited weaknesses, inherited weakness of decades, uh, you know, the, where, uh, you know, the, 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 the system that I'm, I'm working with now and, uh, you know, is, is one which is ossified, which is dysfunctional. And to change that takes time. And I've been part of the 91 to 91 reform, 95 reforms. And I say this, that those reforms were much easier because they were just simple, you know, tariff reduction one line. And even till today, uh, except for a few, uh, you know, commodities where the tariffs have you know, been raised to, 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 to promote the Make in India agenda, the ease of doing business, World Bank's ranking, do not improve if you are, you know, if you are making yourself into a protectionist regime or if you are converting the country or the economy into an anti-investor uh, situation. But they have improved. They improved significantly for India. And the government is going to be launching very soon the ease of business rankings as based on investor perception. So I dare say that I think this is a rather a biased view uh, because uh, the, you know the people of the country, as well as a large number of foreign investors, think the India story is still good. Yes, there have been disappointments, but those disappointments are not the not entirely the making of the government's inability to deliver on their promises. Thank you very much. And if I may just follow up on something you said, Rajiv um, and, and and Ruth, you have now repeatedly 
pointed out that change takes time, uh, perhaps specifically in, in, in a political system like India's, and that of course the second term of the Modi government has in a way only just begun. There are four more years left. So can you briefly, um, if you may, tell us what are the things we should look for? So how will the Modi government, how should the Modi government judge its success over the next four years? What needs to happen in order for the agenda that you have pointed out, he's on track to uh, to follow, uh, to actually be uh, be completed in the, in the next four years. What's still to come? I would have given you a straight answer in terms of uh, you know the rates of growth of GDP, but given the circumstances that we are in and the global economy is in, I don't think that be that be that be uh, useful because it's full of uncertainty. So the agenda that you should be looking forward to is one modernization of agriculture, uh, two. Uh, much greater privatization of public sector enterprises and their movement out of non-strategic non spaces, the, 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 the continuation and culmination of labor reforms, which have been done uh, because there are all the 254 labor reforms have now been codified into four, one of which has been passed by the parliament and three are in the parliament as we speak. And the states have been given the freedom uh, to change them as they like, and some of them have done that. So that's, th that's the second. The third that you would see is that you will get an inventory of land holding by the, by the government agencies to be made available online to the private investor. So the ease of business is the agenda that you will see uh, going forward. And you will see significant improvements in the delivery of public services, both in public education and public health, plus improvement in malnourishment of children and women. When we inherited this came into the came into the office. Our figures were a despairing: 38, 39 percent of India's children malnourished, and 50 percent of the women anemic. That's what we inherited, and you will see. I promise you a distinct improvement on those human development indices of when the, by the time the four years term ends. Um, James, um, I, I see you raise your hand and I did uh, want to ask you a question, so uh, that's good timing. So, James, you have said in your opening statement um, that the Modi government, uh, Modi government has been much more cautious and, and not as radical as, as you had thought and hoped they would be. And you mentioned, you know, things like um, the demonetization, which, which there, I, I guess there's some consensus that may not have turned out um, how it was planned, but there are some, uh, one could argue, success stories to point to. Um, Roof, Roof mentioned the, the GST, the tax reform that has happened. There's a sanitation campaign, I think, that was, that was very successful. Uh, there's Aadhaar, this uh, sort of bio, biometrical information system um, that has made great progress. So the question I want to ask, how much of the disappointment that you felt and that maybe also part, uh, part of the Indian electorate felt from the first term of the Modi government and what we've seen so far, how much of this is really the government's fault or how much of it is, as I think Rajiv and Ruth have argued, just an effect of change in a complex system taking a longer time? Are you premature with your judgment? Well, I mean, the government's been in power for six years now. Um, no Indian government has ever won uh, three consecutive terms, well, apart from the first one, so Mr. Modi could go on and do that. I don't think it's premature. To answer your previous question, I mean, Modi is clearly a political genius. Uh, he's a very persuasive campaigner. Um, people like him. He projects an image of strength. Um, and it isn't the case that his first term in office was a complete failure, as Rajesh said. I have a, some sympathy with some of the things that both he and Ruth said. There were measures introduced, like the bankruptcy court, like GST, which were broadly sensible and should be backed. It's just in the aggregate, there were many other areas that were left unfinished. Uh, I, I wanted to come back, however, to what Rajesh said about, in a sense, what's happening now. Um, and I would agree that, that I think you know, reasonable observers of the Indian scene should welcome many of the measures that have been brought in in these emergency times, the reforms uh, of agricultural laws, some of the labor market experimentations, some of the liberalizations that I think Rajiv himself has been pushing from within are very welcome. Uh, the problem is that the circumstances in which they're being pushed through are now very unwelcoming in, in at least three respects. The first of which is India is now going to take this whacking hit to its economy from COVID. Secondly, it is now trying to emerge into a much less welcoming global environment in which there will be no globalization to pull it up and it will have to make progress on its own. 
And third, a topic close to my own heart because it was the subject of my book, or at least one of the themes, problems of inequality. I mean, I think reasonable people are going to agree that India will emerge from COVID a less equal society than it went in and it was already pretty unequal in the sense that the poorest as you've seen are those who are going to be hit hardest and that means even though there are now some measures welcome measures being taken to introduce economic reforms that the backdrop to this is much much tougher than it would have been if these were introduced 10 years ago and that that's why i think even those of us who wish india well and, and are cheering it on from the sidelines um, as well as other critics might might think that perhaps india has missed an opportunity in the beginning of Modi's first term to, to move more quickly than, than it did. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to briefly address something that uh, I think we've seen a lot of conversation around in the last year, especially when it comes to reporting on India in, um, in, in European media um, to a certain extent. And this is what I think we've referred to before as the cultural agenda. So there is um, a criticism of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his government um, that they are in a way undermining um, the secular nature of the Indian state by promoting um, this cultural agenda, by promoting uh, sort of a, a more Hindu, uh, Hindu focused policies. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot. It came up um, in, the, in the discussion and the reception of um, uh, the Kashmir issue with the, um, uh, the repeal of, of Article 370 came up in the discussion around um, the citizenship law. So I did want to ask Ruth and Rajiv who are arguing for the motion to briefly respond to that. Um, do you feel that the critics who argue along these lines have gotten it wrong? And if so, why is that such a seemingly persistent interpretation that we see? So I think um, I would say this in the context of the people of India. And I believe um, the fact that Modi still enjoys the majority um, support is because people actually believe that uh, revoking Article 370 is a good thing so that Kashmir is legally and administratively integrated with the rest of India so that it can also benefit from the growth and development of India. And also, I mean, as someone who actually spends a lot of time talking to people about um, what they believe in, um, I've had several conversations with people across dif different economic strata and I strongly believe that people are wise. They, they vote for somebody or they choose somebody who they believe is or, um, making things happen or improving their individual uh, lifestyle or their home, their household, who's benefiting their household directly. So I, I would think that I would like to kind of show, uh, highlight the fact that people are wise they know what they are doing and their primary objective is to look at what is for their benefit or their family's benefit. Rajiv? For, well, Rajiv, briefly, and then we'll turn it to Rupa. Yes, Rajiv, please. Nico, I wanted to say uh, simply that I, I challenge anybody uh, to tell me even one economic policy where economic policy where Hindu agenda has been followed or pursued, or there has been any discrimination of any kind for anybody uh, you know, in, in this regime. That's the first part. And, and even in the social policies, et cetera, I don't think there is, can be anybody pointing out to it. Now there, is, there are, there are, there are you know, uh, right-wing uh, fringes in the, in, 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 in the country. You talked about it being a very complex uh, you know, country, et cetera and they have, they have their agenda which is being pushed forward, et cetera, and that keeps getting the press that it, that it gets, and they, that, that's the nature of the democracy. On 370, I would ask everybody to note that the JNK was a part of the country where even women's empowerment was not allowed, where women did not have rights, you know, where, where the children didn't have rights, where none of the you know, modern democratic laws of the Indian government, Indian Republic had applied because they had their own special you know, uh, in a, a, a sort of a framework in which to operate for. It's, isn't that a movement forward? And isn't that also a situation where if you can get, you know, uh, the finality of this question, you know, which is, which is what has happened with Article 370, I think that's what the people have actually supported. Now, this final bit on this one is that I don't think Mr. Modi has ever followed any cultural agenda, whether in Gujarat, or in Delhi. In fact, in Gujarat, he was called by his right-wing right -wing friends. 
the modern Ghazni of Gujarat because he had broken several temples, I think more than a hundred, to get the you know to get the central road clear where he had got his you know the, the you know the, the the free bus the the rapid bus service going. So that's his record, you know. But but the five the, you know but I somebody will have to explain as to why does he get why does this issue keep coming up you know, on the surface and not the others that he has done. All right. Um, let's turn it to Rupa. Are we unfairly overemphasizing the cultural aspects of the record of the Modi government and underemphasizing the economic ones? Is that, that's what I would sort of take away from, from Rajiv's point. So just, um, just, just a quick question. So Mr. Rajiv Kumar said that I was biased, but let me remind him that he actually works for the government. So he's hardly an independent voice here. Um, and just uh, on, on Article 370, uh, I would say that I actually supported uh, uh, abrogating Article 370, but it was the implementation and what happened after which were hugely, hugely problematic. It kept a state in a constant state of lockdown. Uh, they ended up uh, uh, jailing uh, their political opponents. Men, uh, some of them, many of them are still uh, in, under house arrest or at a government facility in detention. Uh, we don't quite know what is happening in Kashmir. Uh, is, is radicalization on the rise as a result of the government's poor handling of the Kashmir situation? So these are all very important questions that one needs to ask. No one is claiming that economic policy in India has been sectarian. Let me make that very clear. So Mr. Kumar is deflecting here. What is problematic is a pursuit of the cultural agenda and uh, you, one has to be uh, dreaming to think that that hasn't happened. The citizenship and amendment bill uh, for the first time brings religion as a criteria for citizenship. It ends up um, uh, uh, sidelining uh, a, a tw a 15 to 20% of India's uh, minority population, Muslims, uh, most notably Muslims, because it affects them directly. Um, and, uh, and the National Register of Citizens, which is a follow-up of the Citizenship Amem Amendment Bill, is also problematic. So there have been um, uh, movements on the cultural agenda which have not uh, which have not been good and uh, and so to deny that it it, it is it is dis that is uh, simply disingenuous and just a couple of uh, quick points Mr. Kumar mentioned that labor labor codes have been combined and uh, but that's not reform you don't just you don't just combine a whole bunch of different laws and then call that a reform uh, it's still difficult to hire and fire workers in India as long as that remains. Uh, it's it's going to be extremely difficult for India uh, for India to be, become a manufacturing hub. Um, All right, um, I do I, I, I do want to I do want to um, move on to one last topic. We're almost out of time um, in this panel discussion before we move on to closing arguments. So let me turn it over again uh, for for one very brief statement to Rajiv and Ruth. Um, this is a question. Um, and by the way, thank you all for your many many questions. There are unfortunately so many that. We're not going to have a chance to address uh, all of them, but I do want to ask one question that's come up here that I think is interesting. So we've seen over the last few days, um, again, reports um, of tension at the India-China border, which is something that has happened before. Uh, we here at HCID have hosted a debate um, not too long ago um, on the India-China relationship. Now, whatever happens in terms of India's economy, whatever happens with reforms, Rajiv, Ruth, it cannot be in India's interest, and it cannot be in Prime Minister Modi's interest to have an open military conflict with China. How will India work to avoid that? I think um, I think the um, I think some both the India Pakistan border and India China border. There are uh, you know the skirmishes happen there, but at the national level, the fact that uh, uh, President Xi Jinping and Modi have started this series of informal discussions. I think that's an excellent initiative. And I think that will continue because both countries are big enough and are wise enough to know that working together on the economic and other uh, trade issues is important and essential for both, both countries. And they are continuing with that and they will continue to do that. Rajiv? James, may, may, very, very briefly, are you as optimistic as Ruth when it comes to the India-China relationship? You're asking me, yeah. you know, Mr. Modi has struck a very reasonable relationship with President Xi, and I think that personal relationship will ensure, as it has done in the past, on more than one occasion, actually twice that I remember, that such border 
uh, you know, um, tensions, as it were, uh, will be, uh, you know, overcome, and uh, the India-China bilateral relations will continue uh, on, the, on an even keel as we go forward. All right. James, very briefly, are you as optimistic about, you know, there not being an escalation in conflict between India and China as Ruth and Rajiv are? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think I'm reasonably optimistic about that. I don't think either state at the moment, given the precarious circumstances of the post-COVID recovery or, or crisis moving into recovery, has an interest in an armed conflict or an escalated conflict. Um, but, you know, accidents can happen. Um, and so this is obviously a, a, a worrying sign, but, um, but no, I'm, I'm not especially alarmed by this. I, I think it's most likely that cooler heads will prevail. All right, thank you very much. We're unfortunately already at the end of, of the discussion part, so we're now going to turn it to closing statements, which are going to be two minutes um, for each panelist. And um, it's going to be the same order than before. So, uh, Ruth, your final two minutes, um, trying to convince the audience to support your view on today's motion, please. So I'll just give four brief points. One is, I think, uh, I know India is a federal country with uh, diverse social, economic, and cultural challenges. But India is also, also has strong institutions, legal, private, NGOs, and people democracy. This COVID situation, however bad it is, it's also a great opportunity for enabling sustainable development, including enhancing the Make in India the Skill India, as well as uh, you know, other initiatives for focusing on migrants being turned, moving into MSMEs uh, such as UP's range. So it is an opportunity for enabling further sustainable development in the country. And my last point is that, as all of us have mentioned, Modi today, I mean, and the rating has gone up in the last three months. He, his uh, popularity has gone up between 80 to 90%. I support people and their choices and their decisions, and they are wise and they know what they need for their welfare. And that is my, uh, I, so, I sort of, that's what I put on the table. Thank you very much. That was precise and that was short. So uh, excellent. Thank you so much for your closing remarks, uh, Ruth Katamuri in London. Um, James Crabtree, uh, your closing statement arguing against the motion, please. Thank you, Nico. I think both Ruth and Rajiv have made a reasonable case for the pro-Modi side, but I still don't think it's convincing. I don't want our side to be a council of despair. You've seen over the last few weeks or months in the Indian state of Kerala, the remarkable things that can be achieved by competent government in India, where the state of Kerala has one of the world's best records in combating COVID-19, much better than uh, my country, the United Kingdom, where Rupa is in Canada, even here in Singapore, Kerala has had one of the world's best records. So. India and its government can do remarkable things. And I want to be an optimist for India's future. I lived there for five years. My son has an Indian middle name. Um, I, I'm rooting for the, the country. I just think that A, the record that Modi uh, has had on economic reforms, despite what Rajesh said, is weak and in many areas disappointing. And as I said before, the COVID circumstance now makes India's future much more difficult. It's going to be harder for India to have any support from a fast growing global economy. It's going to emerge from this weakened. It doesn't have a strong state, despite what Ruth said. It has a, a patchy state capacity um, and it's going to emerge more unequal and more divided. And that makes me think that people will look back on the period of the first Modi term and the early stages of his second and say that Narendra Modi's government was a disappointment. And that's why you should support Rupa and myself on our side of the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, now, uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, your closing statement on why the Modi government is indeed delivering on its promises. Um, you must, one must recognize the uh, complexity that you mentioned, Nico, more often than once uh, in, um, in um, go governing India. Uh, the complexity as you, is, is, is unprecedented because India has dared to take on the three transitions, the political, social, and economic simultaneously, where probably everywhere in the world these have been sequenced. And therefore, to have to build a market uh, economy uh, with, with the private sector leading it in a time when you have given uh, equal democratic rights and, and, and you know, to, to every, part, every citizen of your country is a very complex exercise. 
one must also recognize that India's diversity is humongous. It's just unimaginable. Uh, from you know, from uh, Manipur to, Bega to 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 Mumbai, it's more complex than from Moscow to London. And I think that that diversity means also that you have to constantly find new means and new ways to do things because one size will just not fit all, and you have to keep learning on the job at all times. And this is what Mr. Modi has done, and this is what Mr. Modi is very good at. And, and he is one of the best learners, he's one of the best listeners, he has no ideological hang-ups, and will do uh, whatever it takes uh, for India to, uh, to, to accelerate its growth, uh, uh, growth and get on to a higher growth paradigm, which is both sustainable and equitable, and meets the challenge of the carbon uh, footprint, uh, the carbon constraint. And finally, Nico, which is that, uh, you know, uh, in India, uh, you know, uh, the famous saying, I think Joan Robinson made, that anything that you say about India, the opposite is also true. And therefore, and also in our country, we give the freedom to everybody to say the opposite at all points of time. So this debate will continue. But I think just for the mere fact of India now taking the growth forward and permitting uh, you know, human uh, liberties in full measure, we must, we, must, we must accept that Mr. Modi has done a wonderful job and therefore you should vote for the motion. Thank you very, very much um, uh, for that very precise uh, to the second perfectly timed uh, closing statement. Um, and now the final closing statement against the motion, Rupa Zubramaniya in Ottawa, Canada. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nico. Uh, so India's democracy is not an excuse for failing to um, live up to your promises, the promises you made to the Indian voter. Uh, so don't just take my word for it. Let, let's look at the dismal record, record of economic growth of the last several years. And this was even before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit um, uh, India. Even before the current crisis, growth had uh, dropped below 5%. Um, now that number would be great for an advanced economy, um, but for an emerging economy like India, uh, we should be growing at 8 to 10%, and this is nothing short of a disaster. And Modi did promise to, to get India on a higher growth trajectory, and that clearly has not happened. So COVID-19, uh, it cannot be an excuse for low growth, which was happening even before the pandemic. Um, along with growth, there were other indicators that were all, also heading south, like private investment, foreign direct investment, uh, auto sales, consumption of basic consumer staples, they were all pointing down. Um, also, Modi had promised to create millions of jobs, um, uh, and that has not happened. The government's own data uh, in a report that was so inconvenient to them that it was eventually, that it was suppressed and then eventually leaked to the press, said that unemployment was at a 45-year high at 6.1%. Uh, Even Modi himself had to more or less admit uh, failure on the job situation where he observed that even making Indian street food should count as employment. But presumably this is not what he had in mind when he promised Indians good days would be coming in the form of well-paying jobs, not low value added jobs like frying onion fritters. So uh, we do not believe that the Modi government has kept its promise. Uh, their handling of the COVID-19 pandemic which shut down 70 to 80 percent of the Indian economy uh, has made the economic disaster worse. Uh, the Indian economy is likely to shrink upwards of 10%, and India's total lockdown, the most draconian in the world, and I experienced it firsthand in, in Mumbai, has ended up creating a humanitarian crisis. Um, so the poor have been uh, left poor, uh, for, uh, further uh, uh, pushed back into poverty and, their, and into hunger and destitution, and it will take years, perhaps more, for the economy and, the, and society to recover, not just from the COVID-19 crisis, but the the incredibly poor management of the crisis. Not only has Modi failed to live up to its promises, he's done the opposite. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, you must vote against the motion, no to the motion. Thank, Thank you. you very, Thank you very much, Rupa. Um, and, and that concludes uh, the discussion part of today. Thank you so much to, to everybody. It's now time to vote. Um, so we'll ask for the second poll to be shown. Um, and everybody um, who's joined us today, I hope you've made up your minds. You have about um, 30, 40 seconds to cast your vote before we, before we close the poll. So let us know um, if you have been convinced uh, by the team arguing for the motion, um, Ruth Katamuri, uh, Dr. Rajiv um, Mar, uh, arguing that the Modi government has actually been keeping its promises or if uh, the argument against the motion, James Traftree, Rupa Subramania, 
have um, have convinced you more, um, in which case you should vote no, um, and then we'll see who has uh, who has won this debate. Um, while the poll is still running, um, let me just briefly point out that we would love to hear your feedback on this format and this event today. As I've mentioned, this was um, a, a first for us. Um, once you exit this call, you will see a feedback form pop up in your browser. You can answer some questions there, give us some feedback there. Um, uh, there will also be a link to this form in the thank you email that you will receive within the hour. Um, we hugely appreciate anything you can uh, you can tell us so we can improve on, on, on future events. Um, and with that, let's close the poll. Um, thank you all for voting. It will take us just a little bit to calculate uh, the actual results. So until we're there, um, I do wanna take this time uh, by uh, pointing out two upcoming webcasts that we are hosting um, in the coming weeks that may be of interest to all of you. Um, the first one, uh, which will happen in two weeks in collaboration with uh, the GDI think tank in Switzerland, is going to be about the future of retail and what we can learn from China's e-commerce landscape, uh, to which extent is what is happening there relevant to the retail industry in other parts of the world. That is on June 9, um, lunchtime in Switzerland. Um, this is a public webcast, it's free to register. Uh, you can scan the QR code here for more information or go to our website at asiasociety.org slash Switzerland. Um, and then uh, in early July, Monday, July 6, we are hosting an online event, something that we had originally planned to host live uh, in April here in Switzerland, had to postpone because of the coronavirus, but we're very happy that it's taking place, um, a webcast and a conversation on the situation in Xinjiang, um, the province in China, featuring two journalists, uh, Mega Rajagopalan, Bethany, Ellen Abrahamian, who have reported extensively on that issue. So that should be a very interesting conversation as well. Um, so I'm being told now uh, right on time that the results are ready. Um, so let me turn off the screen here um, and would ask my colleagues to show us the results um, of the debate and the vote now. All right, so um, the results are in and we see that um, there is a change of minus 5% uh, for agreement on the motion and a plus of 20% um, in percentages for the team arguing against the motion. Um, and that means that the team arguing against the motion that the Modi government has been delivering on its promises has won this debate. Congratulations, uh, James and, and Rupa. Um, and, but thank you everybody for uh, taking part in this um, discussion. I think this was excellent. Um, a lot of points to be made, a lot of very, very valuable arguments from, from all sides. And I do very much appreciate um, all of you um, uh, in, 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 all those, in, all those different, in all those different places. Dr. Rajiv Kumar in Delhi, uh, Dr. Ruth Katumuri in London, James Crabtree in Singapore, Rupa Subramanya in Ottawa, Canada. Thank you all very, very much for being here, for being open and frank in your points, uh, for sticking to the time, for being part of this experiment with us. Thanks everybody um, who's been here uh, for your questions, uh, for your participation. I've seen there's a very active chat window. Um, thank you for voting um, and, and, and for doing this with us. We do hope to see you soon again at another Asia Society online event. There are plenty of them around, not just from the Swiss Center, uh, but globally. Um, and to our panelists, again, uh, deeply appreciate you being here um, and debating each other fiercely, uh, but fairly. Um, I think that was tremendously helpful and, and, and deeply insightful. Um, and my biggest thanks to all of you for having been here. And we do hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you very much.